That's a messy Christmas right there. You know, um, some, some weeks ago, um, well, first let me start with this. I think one of the hardest things, and, and as a pastor, there's lots of difficult things that we encounter and have to go through, but, but let me tell you, I think one of the, the most difficult things that I sometimes look forward to and sometimes don't is coming up with something new to do for Christmas, right? I've, I've been in ministry now for over 20 years, and it just seems like, the, I mean, the story should sell itself, but as pastors, we think we got to come up with the next greatest thing and, and come up with some new angle to the Christmas story that you haven't heard before. Um, I'm not going to do that today because there is no new angle. You've heard it before. But ultimately, when we were thinking about this idea of messy Christmas, the thing that Tracy and I wrestled with was, was this idea that, you know, a lot of times when we think of the Christmas story, it's that beautifully manicured nativity scene that you have up in your loft or some kind of cubby hole in your house that, I mean, the hay is placed just right and the donkeys don't smell and, and the cows are perfectly quaffed and the, the shepherds are there and their clothes are nice and wrink, uh, uh, non-wrinkled and the, the wise men stand there even though we all know the wise men weren't at the manger scene, right? Okay, good. But because they're at the nativity in your house, we're going to talk about them. So we have these this beautiful robes, and they're all perfectly clean, even though they've been traveling over dusty highways. They, they, everything looks perfect and amazing. And then we sing carols, and, and away in a manger, no crib for a bed, the little Lord Jesus laid down his sleep head. And we have these beautiful, amazing, sweet stinks of, uh, stories of Christmas. And that's probably the farthest thing from the truth. The the Christmas that Jesus endured was messy. Pastor Tracy, a couple weeks ago, introduced this series with this idea that, that first, that understanding that Jesus didn't come from the perfect family. He actually came from quite a messy family in that. That we look in that passage in Matthew that, that all the lineage of David, that, of David and that Jesus came from and and we see that it wasn't a perfect family. And then we reminded ourselves that, that we don't have perfect families either. Anybody in here have a perfect family? All right, so anybody have a messy family in this room today? All right, and, and now, now I'm even thinking, you know, that's immediate family, but think even further out, like, like relatives way out. Anybody have a messy family that's then you think that far away, right? I mean, there's always somebody, and usually it's us, right? It's me where we all have our messes because we are all imperfect sinners. And so we bring our mess into our family. And then second week, last week, Tracy talked about this messy situation that they've as found as before Jesus comes into the, the story. We have Mary and Joseph and not yet fully married. They're in this betrothal period and Tracy explained that beautifully last week. And and because they're in there, they're not supposed to be together, but all of a sudden Mary is pregnant. And now they have to deal with this. And, and Tracy explained how they could have been stoned. There are many things that could have went on, but even without the stoning, I'm sure there was a lot of people that were pointing fingers. And as they walked through their little village, probably many people turned and whispered into the ear of that person next to them, maybe if not pointing with their fingers, pointing with their eyes. Because this was a messy situation. We have a woman who is not married, now pregnant. And what was Joseph to do? A difficult situation. But we saw last week that God, and we saw the last couple weeks, that God can use messy families. He can use messy situations to bring about His purpose in our lives and in the lives of the world. Actually, that happens more, more time than not. If you think back on your life, when are the times that you felt like you learned the most? A lot of times it's when you have fallen and had to get back up and you've had to trust in the Lord. When you've gone through sticky things or sticky situations. And sometimes we put ourselves in those sticky situations. Sometimes we are placed there because of somebody else's sin or maybe just the providence of God. You think to Mary and Joseph, they, they didn't ask for this messy situation. They were actually honored by God. It says that Mary was revered above all her. But that doesn't sound like the best revering. I would rather be revered in a, a different way, right? But Mary was honored, but honored with a very sticky situation for her. This week, we're talking about a messy world. Um, Jesus didn't come into the world in a perfect situation. 
It was messy. There was a lot of things going on. Let's, let's picture it this way. Anybody in this room have a teenager or had a teenager? Let's just say. Have or had? Okay. For those of you that haven't or they aren't there yet, pay attention. Okay. So, so anybody in this room have a perfect teenager? Okay. Anybody in this room have a perfect teenager with a perfectly clean room? Okay, who's the other way? Whose teenager has a messy room in this building right now? Wow, okay, all right, there you go. All right, so, so imagine this. Imagine your teenager's room at the messiest it's ever been and you're tasked with getting to the door to the bed to God to try to get something off of the bed. And it's like minefield, isn't it? You're like, oh, what am I gonna step on here? You know, is there a leftover pizza here? I mean, what's going on? How am I gonna ever make it to my destination? And so, but somehow by the providence of God, you make it from the door to the bed and you grab whatever dirty clothes you were coming in here to get or whatever you were trying to get off that bed and you stand up and all of a sudden at that very moment, all the power in your house goes out. Now there's pitch dark. Been there, really? Really? Lynn, you've been there? <laughs> okay, so, so imagine that. Now, now all of a sudden you can't see a single thing and you know the mess that's in front of you, but somehow you've got to get from the bed to the door and then to the laundry, where, wherever you're heading from there. That's kind of what happened here on this Christmas story. Let me... Let me explain it this way. So let's, let's start with the mess, all right? Like I said, Jesus didn't come into this world in a, in a perfect circumstance because there is no perfect circumstance. There's never the perfect time except God's perfect time. And this, the time that Jesus came, was the appointed perfect time. But let's look at some of the mess. And this is only a little bit of the mess that the world was in when Jesus came into the world. First, um, the people of God were under the rule of the Roman Empire. Okay, let's look at the scripture. Luke 2, 1 through 5. And we always kind of just skim over this and don't realize the enormity of it. But it says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town, and Joseph also went up from Galilee from the town of Nazareth to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. So the first thing is to understand that the people of God were under the rule of someone else. They were not a sovereign country. They were not a sovereign state. They, they were under the rule, under the thumb, under the authority of another rule. Imagine this. Imagine if World War II would have gone different and Hitler and the Germans were successful in completely taking over the world. Imagine how your life and my life would be different. That's what the people of Israel are going through. Now, this was the Roman Empire, and at that time, and probably still today, they had conquered more than anybody else. Most of Europe and Asia, and it was a huge kingdom ruled. And they, they, they did it differently than, than the Greeks did before and the Persians did, but they ruled with an iron fist and they had put soldiers in different places and these centurions that kept the peace. But they did some good things. And the ruler over Jerusalem at that time was a man named Herod. And he did some good things. He worked with the religious leaders and helped do some rebuilding and renovating of the temple and made, did, made some strides to create peace within it. But still, this census that we read about reminded the people that they were not in control of their own life. Imagine Mary and Joseph. They, they were dealing with this very messy situation. And all of a sudden, now they have to go back to Jerusalem, I mean to Bethlehem. And Bethlehem was some 90 miles away. So we were talking and, and, and probably a, a young woman, pregnant woman, maybe traveled 10 miles a day in the wilderness and through this desert. It was a dangerous road and full of, full of perils, but they had to make this journey. 
And it probably took them a week and a half or more to make this journey. This was not convenient. This was not nice and clean. This was a messy travel. And whether she traveled on a donkey or not, we don't know. The Scripture doesn't tell us. But we know they made the journey, and they made the journey because they were forced to. But here's the thing, is that God used this rule of Rome and this census to actually help Mary and Joseph a little bit, I believe. Because now all of a sudden they went from a town where everybody knew them, knew the trouble they were in, knew the sticky situation or messy situation they were in, and took them to another village in Bethlehem where probably not too many people knew them, if anybody. And now they could almost have a fresh start. Did you ever wonder why they never went back to Nazareth after the baby was born? I think because they found a, a bit of rest, a bit of reproof from the Lord that God sovereignly got them out so that maybe their situation could resolve a little bit and they wouldn't be known and be pointed at and be talked about. So and they were under Roman rule. The second thing, the second thing is that the nation of Israel itself under this rule was fracturing the people had always tried to stay together. Even in the, the Babylonian Empire, they were, they were spread out. Ultimately, they came back together and they did some rebuilding of the temple and the walls and the area in Jerusalem. But, but, but now there was a, a further division going on. It was a division from within. The thing that had held them together, that God purposely made to hold them together, was their faith. But their faith was being fractured. Their religion was being fractured. There were groups of people. They were called Pharisees and Sadducees and Essenes and Zealots. And, and these group of religious leaders, they, they were divided by doctrine and practice. You know, some of them believed that, that people could be raised from the dead. Some of them said, no way, that's not possible. How dare you believe that doctrine? And there were other doctrines that they, they fought over and they had disagreements over, but they also disagreed on practice. There were some, those zealots, and they were like, listen, we need to forcefully take back the kingdom of Israel. We need to overthrow the Roman goal. Whatever, whatever it takes, we're going to do that. And many of the other religious leaders were like, no, no, everything's good. Don't mess up the apple cart. If God wants us in power, God's going to send his Messiah and he'll take care of it. We don't need to take care of it. And so, so they differed in doctrine, they differed in practice, and because there was these divisions, they were falling apart from within. You know, sometimes we look at the divisions within the Christian church these days, and I wonder if we're in, the reason we're in the same peril and messy world that we're in is because of the same thing, is we've, we've so divided ourselves based upon doctrine and practice that we're not truly being the body of Christ in the world that we're called to be. So the nation of Israel was fracturing. They were no longer sovereign nation. And even religiously, they were struggling. The third thing we talked about, Tracy talked about last week, is, is you know, it was a messy situation, but it was part of this messy world that they found themselves in, was the virgin birth. I mean, I mean, I mean is this really how the Messiah would come? Is this really how God decided to send the, the Savior of the world like we sang about? Not only through a virgin, but to a teenage girl that was placed in a super bad situation because of it. I mean, if it was me, if I was God, it would be some like magic bolt of lightning, like whoa, bam, right there. There's the Messiah, and there's like rock music playing in the background. Like Jesus is coming down. That's that's the way I would bring the Messiah into the world, right? You know, angels singing. No, wouldn't it be that? be something else. But, but God in his sovereign will, knowing all things, said, this is how we're going to do it. This is the right way. This is going to bring order to the mess, even though at first glance, it looks like it doesn't. Next is the poverty of Mary and Joseph. Listen to Luke 2, 6 through 7. It says this, and while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in a swaddling clothes laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. I'd never thought about this before, but Joseph knew where they were going, right? He knew that he had to go to Bethlehem. I'm sure he had a little bit of forewarning of where they were going and when they had to go. 
So the question is, why didn't he plan? Why didn't he call ahead, give him his credit card, and, and book a room while he was on the way, right? Why didn't, he, why didn't he think some? And maybe the reason is because he just couldn't. He didn't have the funds. He wasn't sure exactly how it was going, how, what, what they were going to do when they got there. He was hoping maybe they could find somebody that they knew or somebody to stay with, or somebody would just take them in, but for some reason, because of how many people had come back to the city, there were an overabundance of people, and there was no place for them to lay their head. Now, I'm sure if they would have had the funds, because money talks, right? If they would have had the funds, they would have found a place. But either he just didn't think ahead, or they just were so poor that they could not think ahead. They could not provide a place they found that a king was born into a very poor carpenter family. When you think about it, a king is usually born right to a wealthy, powerful family. That makes a king. And we know that he was born in the line of David, and so, so it falls in line that he was in the line of the king. But, but at this moment, the king was, had no power. He had no wealth. You see, the king of kings is born in a cave and laid in a manger. It's it seems not to be the best start for God's Messiah. But again, in, in God's amazing sovereign will, even though humanly it looked bleak, some year and a half or so later, God sent the Magi. And then what did they give them? Gold and frankincense and myrrh. All things that they could use. Why? Because they were poor and they needed help. And eventually soon, they were going to need to escape to Egypt and they would need funds. God provided in his way, in his time for Mary and Joseph so they could get out of Bethlehem, move to Egypt and have the funds and have the ability to do what needed to be done as God led and directed them. And so part of the messy world is this poverty of Mary and Joseph that the king came not to a glorious family but to one that was humble and lowly of means. And then the last thing that to me is a great sign of how far this world had fallen was what we call in the theory world is the massacre of the innocents. It's found here, Matthew 2, 16 through 18. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and he killed all the male children in Bethlehem and all that region who were there two years old or, and, old and, or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, a voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel, weeping for her children, she refused to be comforted because they are no more. And that passage in, is found in Jeremiah 31, 15, that reference in there. Here's the question. What kind of world must it be to allow a ruler, Herod, to indiscriminately kill babies at a whim and there be no pushback? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, where, where were the protesters? Where were the people that said, how, I, how, do, how can you do that? I mean, in our humanity, we look and we say, how in the world would that be a right for a ruler to just lay down a law and say, every child, innocent child, under two years old in Bethlehem, killed. And nobody raised up and said, we need to get rid of this guy because this is horrible. How could he do something like this? And you know, one thing I, I found interesting as I was studying this week, is, and I had never heard this because I'm naive, I guess, but um, is there are, are many people in the theo theology realm, theology realm is that don't believe that actually happened. They say that because there are no extra biblical evidence of this event, there's nothing in Josephus and some of the other historical writers talking about this killing of the innocents, that it must not have happened. But I truly believe it's in God's word it happened. I can't just take parts of it that I like and say, oh, I'm going to believe this and not believe this. If it's in God's word, then I have to believe it. And so I believe it happened. But I have to do, I have, understand that it's more than believe, that there are reasons that we can firmly stand that it happened. First, it's in line with Herod's nature. If you knew anything about Herod, he was not a very nice man. There's one quote in one of the extra biblical material that says that it was better to be a pig in Herod's house than to be one of his kids. 
Because at some point during his reign, I think he murdered two to three to four of his own children. Anybody that showed any sign of raising up to maybe try to take power from him, immediately killed. I mean, this was not a very good man. It was, it was like mothers-in-laws. And, uh, I can understand mothers. No, no, I can't do that. Um, but there was all the different relatives that he just murdered at a whim. And, and these things were happening. It wasn't just an, a small incident, but these happened all the time. It, it also matches with his psychological profile. He was always worried about somebody coming and taking power. He was an unstable man, just prone to feats of rage that just cost people their lives. And then the third thing that I, that I say to kind of confirm that this happened is that this really was nothing for Herod. You know, people say, well, if this was such a huge deal, somebody should have recorded it, right? But let's think about it. In, in the town of Bethlehem, it was a very small town. There might have been anywhere from 9 to 15 babies at that time under the age of two that were killed. So for Herod, it's nothing. Just another walk in the park. People were like, there's Herod again. What a jerk. I can't believe it. Don't say that. But, you know, I mean, it didn't raise to his level. There was a point at the end as he was getting sick. He got so worried that the Israel leaders were going to take power, the religious leaders were going to take power after he died, that he tried to call this meeting of all the Jewish leaders and try to gather them into one place, and he was going to slaughter them. Just wipe them out so that they didn't have that leadership in place so that there would be nobody to rise up and try to take power after he died. But he, uh, in grace of God, passed away before he was able to pull that off. But people knew what a man this was. And so it, it very easily proves that something like this could have happened and did happen because it is in God's Word. See, these, this massacre of the innocents paled in comparison to many of the other things that he did. And so, in the midst of all of these things that made this a very messy world, we also have to remember that darkness is added. You see, God had been silent for 400 years or more at this point. There was a point where, where God took his presence out of the temple and it left never to come back and then there was a point at the end of the last book of the bible of the old testament where 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 he's just removed is gone and then from that point for 400 years there's no prophets there's no word of god there's nothing no voice no no presence of god even though i we know he was there because god doesn't leave but he did not make himself known to anybody. He did not give a word to anybody to tell to the people. So for 400 of the years, the people were in this waiting. They didn't know what God was doing. They felt lost. Darkness was fading. It was coming upon them as the light faded. And as darkness came upon them, hope was being removed. There was a, another book, an extra biblical book called the Book of Maccabees. And in that book, there was a quote talking about this time period. And it said, So they took down the altars and stored the stones in a convenient place on the temple hill until there should become a prophet to tell them what to do with it. You see, they didn't have the word of God like we have today. And so when God didn't speak through a prophet or through a king or through a leader, they did not know what to do. They couldn't hear the word of God. They could not feel God's presence in their lives and know what to do. And so darkness reigned and so like that room of our teenager they were standing and they didn't know which way to go they were completely lost and so they even took down the stones of the altar and said we don't need these anymore because god's not talking to us but then there came a hope isaiah chapter 9 2 through 7 says this the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They they rejoice before you as with the joy at the harvest. And they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. 
For every boot of the tramping warrior and battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of the peace There will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from thence time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. In the beginning, darkness covered the earth and God said let there be light and there was light and God saw that the light was good the true light which gives light to everyone came into the world the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it It is a light for the lost, the searching and the seeking. A light for the darkest valley. A light to drive out fear, even in the shadow of death. When we believe in the light, we become children of the light. It shines in us, through us. If we walk in the light, if we let it shine before others, we become a city on a hill the light of the world. When we let his word light our path, others will follow. We become a beacon of hope to a world in darkness. Our lives reflect the glory of his resurrection. He makes us a light for the nations, so his salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Let there be light. For at one time you were darkness, But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Have you ever stood in darkness a while? This room is amazingly dark. Sometimes we come in here and it's just you can't see in front of you. There's something about lightness, darkness. It just takes a single light, right? It just takes a single light to begin to break through the darkness. You see, Christ's light is available to all people. It's available to help help you make sense of the messy world by seeing how God has been engineering the world to bring about the sovereign will for a long time now. And if he can engineer the circumstances for Jesus, he can engineer your circumstances and your messy world. You see, it's available to help you find your path in a dark world. The psalmist says that he has a light into our path. You know, all of us, a lot of us want this light that's so bright that we can see 100 yards ahead of us, right? But the scripture only promises this light in front of us here, one step at a time. Let's go back to that, that messy room, right? You don't need to see all the mess around you. All you need to have is a light that will shine the path so that you can make your way out of the darkness. And there has been only one way. There's only one truth. There's only one light out of the darkness. And that's found in John 1. John 1 says this, In the beginning was the Word, And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He carried came as a witness to bear witness about the light, what all might believe through him. He was not the light, 
but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was made in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about Him and cried out, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because He was before me. For from His fullness we, w- we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made Him known. As we believe, we take up a bit of His light. The question is, what do we do with it? You know, we can just shine it on ourselves and make sure we look beautiful. Or we can turn it out into a world that needs to see the light of Christ. If you're a believer in this room with me, join with me with your phone if you got it. Right? I didn't do this for a service. Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Do you believe that this light is important to a world that's in need? Who are you sharing it with? Who are you loving on? Who are you bringing the love of Christ into their life this Christmas season? Go out. Don't keep the light to yourself. Don't even just keep it in this room. If it's the only time you turn your light on, there's a dark world around you that needs it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. God, we are amazed and always reminded that you are the same throughout all things and that the mess that Jesus found himself in, a very similar mess that we find ourselves in, God. We look at the mess of the killing of the babies and we go, man, how could anybody do that? But then we look at our world and society and see very similar things. God, there's so much mess. And as Christians, sometimes all we do is focus on the mess and complain about it. But we've got to get on the journey of leaving the bed, getting out of the room, and using the light of Christ to bring light to wherever God calls us to go. So God, I, I pray for each person in this room. I lift them up. That I know there's people in here that are going through a lot of mess. Their world is just full of it right now. God, I pray that if they've never accepted the light of Christ, they don't understand what that even means, that they'll come and talk to one of us, talk to one of our prayer warriors or our pastors or our elders or somebody, because ultimately the only way out of darkness is through light. And Jesus says, I am the light of the world. So God, maybe there's somebody in this room that at one point their light shone bright. But for a while they've struggled. They've taken a a bushel or a bush and hid their light from the world. God, I pray that you would help them use this morning to just convince them that they need to get out and let the light out. God, wherever it is, God, I don't don't know what you're speaking to your people this morning, so I just pray that you would, through your Holy Spirit, that you would guide them to whatever they need to do, God. If we just come and sit in this place and never deal with you, then we've just wasted time. So 
But God, Father, I pray that if you have spoken to hearts, that you will move hearts and legs and voices, whether they just need to come to the altar and pray, whether they need to come and have, have one of our, our prayer team or elders pray with them and over them, and maybe they just need to hear the truth about what the light does. Or maybe their world is so full of darkness they don't even know how to make one step. Let this be a place where we equip our people to be light bearers. God, we love you and praise you. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.